Hi class, and welcome to Module 2. In today's lecture, we will discuss the essential elements of youth development programs. In our last lecture, we discussed some of the guiding frameworks that make a youth uh, program a quality youth development program. So today's slides will further drill down into the essential characteristics that help make for a good program possible. So let me give you some background context. In 1999, 4-H, which is the largest youth development organization in the U.S., roughly serving about 6 million youth per year, wanted to know the answer to the following question. What positive outcomes in youth, adults, and communities result from the presence of the critical elements in a 4-H youth development experience? So they formed a task force, which is titled here at the bottom of the slide as the National 4-H Impact Design Implementation Team, it's a long title, in an attempt to answer this question. And the answer will come a few slides later. But as a result of working with this task force, they determined there are eight essential elements that need to be addressed in order to have a positive youth development experience. You can see the list of eight essential elements here. So what happened was as the professionals began to focus more on creating these environments to enhance positive youth development for youth, the contextual factors became fairly universal in both the research and the recommendations for programs as they were applied. So remember, positive youth development builds on young people's strengths and assets. It is this type of development, developmental programming that results in healthy and pr productive youth and their families. So to begin, the first point is a uh, positive relationship with caring adults. Caring adults are one of the most critical elements in quality programming. Not only do they act as an advisor, guide, or mentors, but adults also set the boundaries and expectations for young people. It's not specifically stated here, but generally we're talking about adults who aren't family members. While sometimes parents do play the role of teacher or coach or program leader, for most youth, these interactions are with adults who aren't their parents. Let's use your personal stories. So think about the individuals who have had a positive impact on your life. Some of you might think this is an easy concept to grasp as a teacher or coach. Coaches are generally the ones people list as influential, but seriously consider how your past and your future for that matter were shaped by adults. While at the time as a younger person, I didn't really consider how others helped me. I pretty much considered the successes that I had as a direct result of my efforts and talents. I was a very individual, individualistic person and I never considered how collectively we can help others achieve their success. This is just my story. And as I became a youth development researcher, I started to understand what part I played, and how there were larger forces working with me for my success. Next, we have the environmental space that youth encounter. Youth who do not feel safe from physical or emotional harm and abuse will not likely to be engaged nor reap the maximum benefits of your program. First off, when you are designing your program, you will probably be able to list off and address the issues related to physical safety because those are the ones that people think of first. But I also challenge you to consider how the space you design impacts youth, youth emotionally as well. Are the games the, that you design competitive or collaborative? Competition can be positive in some cases, but numerous studies show that collaborative experiences generally reach a larger audience. If a child is afraid to, of competition because they aren't very athletic, how do you think they're going to feel emotionally about your program? And so that previous question leads us to this slide. If youth feel that they belong, they're more likely to be actively and positively involved. Creating a sense of belonging and celebrating everyone's success is very important. The feelings that last beyond the programs or activities is what you're trying to shape. So keep this in mind. 
now we get to learning. And learning does not take place only in a formal classroom. Some of the best learning opportunities occur when you do not realize that they're learning until the activity or program is over. I like to look at non-formal education, like how you choose your friends. This may sound a bit odd, but hear me out. Making friends generally does not require intentional effort or deliberate thought. What happens is the circumstances exist which allow for people to meet and ideas to be discussed and take place, right? You're just speaking with someone or involved in the same hobby, and before you know it, you begin speaking with this person outside that original context. In my opinion, this is how non-formal education works as well. People don't really grasp that idea that they're learning in these non-formal situations. They simply are having fun. They're engaged, and it happens that a new skill is learned. So then, how... How can you as a youth worker who is required to be intentional and deliberate begin to process these activities that are critical to optimizing learning? So opportunities for mastery is one of those ways to optimize learning. So you see the four bullet points which lay out the evolution of skill building. First, youth are given the introduction Introduction to the opportunity to build upon knowledge, skills, or attitudes. After the introduction, youth must be given a chance to demonstrate their use of the skill or knowledge. With time and practice, you will see the outcome of skill mastery. And it's noted that abilities of the youth is important to determine if mastery can be accomplished. For an example, in your previous coursework, you may have been seen this titled as age-appropriate activities. If the task being asked of a youth is too advanced, then the youth will fail and will fail at accomplishing the task. On the other side, if the tasks are too easy, then youth can become bored and disengaged. Therefore, if the appropriate challenges and opportunities to advance in skill are not present, the outcome is youth will not be very interested. The next essential element is the opportunity to see oneself as an active participant in their future. Here we discuss hope. Hope about your future, what your life will be like, what will you be or what will you do as an adult? And this one is critical as well. It is hope that provides the energy for the transition from now to later. Just think about the question, what do you wanna be when you grow up? It's a very common question and we've asked it many times, but it has such power. But there's a caveat that you might not have considered, especially if you come from a privileged life. How do you engage youth to consider a life or lifestyle around something they may have never seen? Unless you have role models or know people you want to emulate, a youth's concept about what is possible with their life can become very limited. Therefore, it is essential that all youth have the opportunity to see themselves in many different future possibilities. This is done through creating a sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy, such as statements like, I can influence what happens to me, which exposes youth to decisions that must be made in order to understand the steps related to future career goals. This is called goal setting. And it is a key for future growth and development within our youth. On the other side, youth with no to little vision of their future are more likely to make poor decision and practice risky behaviors as they do not see future. Another essential element is the opportunity for self-determination. Self-determination is the belief that you have an impact on your life's events that you are an active player in what happens to you, and that life is not passive and is simply happening to you. Also, self-determination contributes to a sense of self-efficacy as well. So giving youth opportunities to make decisions when it is appropriate can lead to a feeling of competence as they navigate and evaluate the rewards and consequences of their decisions or the pros and cons of making decisions. The last essential element is different from the previous ones in the fact that it is centered on others. As you see, 
beginning to practice of serving others begins with thinking less about yourself and more about others. Also, you need to understand that they are a part of a community and not a lone entity. The outcome of numerous studies show that practicing service to others during childhood is more likely to continue into adulthood. Service helps youth gain a better understanding of their ability and responsibility contribute to the greater good. Okay, so this is the review of the eight essential elements. But I want you to take you back to the question that was asked earlier in the presentation by the National 4-H Council, which was what positive outcomes in youth, adults, and communities result from the presence of the critical elements in a 4-H youth development experience? We're getting there, but I want you to see in the next couple steps that by listing the essential elements, we can start categorizing them into the needs that are being met. And so those needs are belonging, mastery, independence, and generosity. This here is a visual representation in table format of the eight essential needs, eight essential elements into the four needs. Sorry about that. And it may be easier to think of them uh, simply by the letters B-I-G-M or Big M, belonging, independence, generosity, and mastery. I made it easy for you in this little moniker, and it can help you remember when structuring your programs that you need to provide multiple opportunities in which all four of these needs are met and are experienced by the youth that are participating. So here is where we get to the outcomes of the 4-H work. This diagram illustrates the interrelationships of several research studies and their perspectives on youth development. As the basic needs of youth are addressed through a setting that's designed to promote positive youth development, they lead to positive outcomes. The positive outcomes are connection, confidence, character, and caring. And competence, sorry, I shorted one. When combined, these five C's, which you may have heard them called before, indicate a greater likelihood of contribution. And tying that back to Karen Pittman in her statement about problem-free is not fully prepared and fully prepared is not fully engaged, contribution is fully engaged. So now you're starting to see how the links in a long chain of positive youth development programs how they have intentionality in these programs. Let's take a look at your assignments this week and see how intentionality plays a part. Module two, practicum. So use the internet to find a program fitting each of the grade level categories listed below as listed in the eCampus assignment and complete the remainder of the chart based on the website information. Use a different website or program for each age group. The chart on the right portion of the slide is the same as the link on eCampus. I just wanted to make sure you complete the correct assignment so I have a visual of it here. End of module assignment two. EOEM two is the beginning of your curriculum project. All of the work that you put into the EOM will result in a better grade for the final project. Spend some time brainstorming options for this assignment. When you decide, what you decide here will influence weekly assignments for the rest of the semester. So to begin, plan a three day overnight or a five day, eight to five p.m. kind of program for 60 to 80 youth. It should focus on incorporating the eight essential elements into a model program. Hopefully it will be something that you will be able to implement someday so be creative and assume that money or other resources are not a constraining factor. As you plan the schedule, think back to when you were a kid and how you would have responded to the way you designed your program. While there are things that have to take place, such as introducing the staff or sharing the rules, they don't have to be boring or unbearable. Use your creativity, imagination, and the internet and personal experiences to inspire you. So as I wrap up today's lecture with the following question, 
What program are you going to design? Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next lecture.